was from the afternoon we are shifting to end zone uh, system sorry end end zone uh, that uh, we met through the feedback feedback so there onwards the lectures will be hands on right and today at 4 pm there is an ICT lecture that will continue with the two lectures from 4 pm onwards so what is the afternoon one it's like uh, it's at noon 2 pm so we call it yeah. what is the name of the end to end zone and okay. end to end zone Okay, thank you, Subra, for the kind introduction. So, um, yeah, I would just like to complete maybe the round of introductions. And so there are a few MTECs, a few PhD students, and anybody from industry? Maybe not. Anybody from other sectors? Like I know there should be some people from defense. This one, yeah? And two, two, okay. Okay, so, and, um, okay, so it's kind of a bit heterogeneous. That's fine. Any faculty from... Uh, here? No, good. Okay, um, like a few words about my background, like Suvra said a bit, so just you know, to give you an idea where I come from. So I do have a couple of Master of Science in um, Electronic Engineering and Mathematics. I do have a PhD in Electronic Engineering, the specialization in telecommunications like wireless networks. I did work in three countries so far, so I did my education in the beginning of my research career in Italy. And then I did um, PhD and postdoc in Denmark. And then I, I've, I've been a faculty in uh, Trinity College in Ireland for the past five years. Um, I was actually a visiting professor in IIT KGP two years back. Some of you might remember me. <coughs> and um, so I stayed for three months. So I've been interacting actually with Suvra's uh, group um, for the past uh, two, three years. So we are doing some work at the moment. I have two students from Suvra's group in my lab in Dublin at the, at the very moment to do some research with my team there. So hopefully it will pick up and this time we could also combine it with um, a few, a couple of IEEE talks from my senior professor there in Dublin. So it's, it's a good chance I think for you to hear what we are doing. So now the purpose of this course, uh, some uh, like uh, indication what this course is not okay so this is not a very detailed course about um, any specific uh, topic it's more of a uh, overview okay it is true that in the last um, uh, half more or less of the course I'm going I'm digging deeper into some recent research topics so we are going to see more details about that in any, uh, but in any event, that's still not a uh, full course, right? So we are, we are still talking about a few hours. So the idea behind this course is to give you a, an, um, an understanding, okay, of some possible directions for the future um, telecom and mostly actually wireless networks, and hopefully to inspire some possible um, topics for your research, okay, or at least to, you know, have a um, deeper look into some aspects. So I hope at least it will, you know, spark some some interest. So that if that happens, then I'm happy. I don't pretend this course to be fully comprehensive and fully detailed and to teach you everything there is to know, because that would require a few courses, okay? So that, that's not meant for that. What this course is, hopefully, it's, um, it's uh, like, a, in a sense, a catalog of ideas and some, you know, possible problem statements or at least some hints of problem statement for your research. And at the very least, I hope it will give you some update on, you know, uh, current uh, trends, both from industry and uh, academia in, uh, in Europe and US. So I hope that that is going to be accomplished. Um, as I said this morning, there are uh, four uh, parts of this course, so four modules. They are not exactly uh, same in size, so some are longer, some are shorter, but you know, we have four. So in the beginning, uh, which is about, um, the first module is about um, in 10 lectures. We are going to talk about um, the, the basics of 5G systems. So why are we talking about 5G? What is driving it? Uh, what are the requirements? And um, the second module is going to be about um, uh, physical layers, so some signal processing um, techniques, okay? Not, again, the, the full set, but some of the relevant ones. The third module will be about um, 
of topologies. So topology simply means how a network is arranged, right? So where you put your uh, transmitters and receivers, okay? Mostly from the viewpoint of base station, so points of access to the network. So we won't look too much into the user deployment. That's another topic altogether with some problems like mobility. So we are more focusing at the moment in taking a snapshot of the network and you know arranging the uh, base stations in some way uh, and then see what happens, okay? Um, the last part of the course, it's more researchy. So this is what we call new theoretical insights. I mean, these are most of what I'm going to talk about in the next two weeks are, re are research topics, okay? But the last one, it's a bit more blue sky research. So the first part of the course is more, in a sense, following a, a, a bit of track, okay? These are things that will happen one way or another. The last part is a bit more speculative. Blue sky is like long-term research. It might happen or might not happen in the real system for 5G. I hope in with time it will become uh, something useful, okay, for the telecom community. Uh, so, but it is definitely a bit more far-fetched. Okay, so these are, I in, a, in a broad way, these are the topics. Um, some few l things about logistics. So there are two lectures every day, one at 11.30, one at 3 p.m. Um, you're welcome to interact with me anytime. I think the designated, uh, say, um, interaction time is 4 to 5. I'll be in my office, okay, and except for today and tomorrow because we have other I IEEE lectures. But in general, I'll be in my office. And you can send me an email and you know if you need uh, to get more information you didn't understand something something you think might not make total sense to you you let me know i'm happy also to share publications and other you know references such as good books you know if i'm aware of and you just let me know okay i i instead of you know swamping you with uh, needless information i prefer a more you know uh, unicast approach right you tell me what you want and then i'll give it to you so i don't believe broadcast is too good for these things, okay? If not, it becomes spam, okay? So you let me know, and uh, if I can accommodate uh, your request, I will do it. If not, you know, if it takes me a bit of time, I'll, I'll try to do it. I never claim to know all the answers, so I, I won't know all the answers. Some I will know, and I will answer right away. Some I will, you know, have to think a bit about, but I will promise at the very least some sort of feedback, okay? And if I don't have the answer to some of your questions, it might be good, because it might be open research, right? And then. You, you might go about it and investigate it. That's how it works. Okay. Good. Any question about the logistics? There are two exams, uh, small exams. I think it's going to be multiple choice as far as I am aware. So I'll prepare one for, um, what is it, 28th, so Tuesday week. Okay. And another one, it will be on um, the Tuesday after that, so the last day of the course. And it's going to be about. Uh, 45 minutes, so yeah. So these exams are going to be run at two, okay? So you should have gotten the schedule with these indications, okay? If there is any, also any question about logistics and so on, please uh, let me and Suvra know, and we'll try to answer, okay? Good, so I hope you um, uh, fasten your seat belts, and we are trying to uh, take off, okay? Let's see where it leads us. First, we should change light. Yeah. Okay. Good. Doesn't work like this. Okay. So, the first lecture uh, is going to focus on uh, scenarios. So, what is a scenario? These are it's a general, vague word, but in es in essence, it means uh, some setups that are of interest. Okay. So, a scenario could be uh, to do with a specific use case or maybe a more general one, but you kind of set the scene for a problem of interest. Okay. Um, that's what more or less a scenario is. Um, now, why do we keep talking about new generations? Okay, uh, I think it's fair to say that a part of the generation game is commercial. Okay, it's not just scientific or technological. There is also a bit of commercial uh, hype, right? So you do need new products um, to keep up the market and the, you know the investments and so on and profit. And you do also need to rebrand things, right? You, it's like with televisions or any other appliance. You don't keep calling the products the same way, right? You have to give a flavor of novelty, right? So there's a bit of branding. Uh, that's true, but there, is, there are also new uh, technological uh, capabilities and new requirements and new services that justify changing name now and then. 
it's not a deterministic formula, okay? So it's not that every X years uh, there is a change in generation, but in the main, we could say every decade there is a new generation appearing. So as far as I'm aware, we started to talk about 5G more or less at the beginning of this decade. So research has been underway for, for a while, I would say two, three years at least. And normally it works that there is a cycle of research which is about five to seven years, more or less. And then it slowly uh, goes into standards and eventually into products. Okay, so if I think back to 4G, we started to do research on 4G, roughly speaking, at the beginning of my PhD. So I started PhD in 2004, and you start to see LTE products now. So you see that there is, roughly speaking, between the research starts and the actual uh, first de deployments uh, and, and products release about a decade, more or less, okay? So I think the first time I heard about 5G at least was about three to four years ago. So you could envision that by mid-2020, more or less, you will have, um, so by 2025, you will have the deployment of these networks. And by then, you I'm sure you will hear about 6G, okay? I don't know when this will end, but not in the foreseeable future. Um, some general messages uh, from former generations, okay? There has always been uh, an increase in data rate, okay? Uh, there has always been an increase in, in, in what the users expect. Right, in a sense, to pro providing better products means also to spoil the customers, right? You will not accept to pay a single cent more, possibly, and you will not accept anything less than what you have. Actually, you would expect much more, but for the same price, like this flat rate, right, kind of policy. So, in a sense, if you will, um, mm, telecom, and especially wireless, uh, is a victim of its own success, right? The better you do, the more people expect of you, and I'm sure most of you will be top in your class or your profession, and I think you can right, uh, recognize this situation in your life. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing to be successful, but pay a price, okay? So we are paying a price for being successful here uh, in, this, in this domain. Uh, as Luis said in the morning, it's an ever-evolving domain, much more than other, I don't comment about other fields of science because I'm not too familiar, but definitely about engineering, I can say Compared to what I see, for example, in mechanical or you know, other fields of engineering, they tend to be a bit more stable. They do, of course, very good work and good research, but it looks to me the pace of change is a bit slower because of the technologies involved. In, in telecom, it's been really a wild ride. Okay? I, I do remember myself when there were no cellular phones. I didn't have internet for the first about 20 years of my life. It's unthinkable now, but that's how it used to be. Uh, back a couple of decades. So, you know, things have been changing a lot. Um, and some things that have been actually uh, more or less appearing a long time with generations, um, I would not, I think at some point there was a discussion about uh, devices getting smaller in size. Now that has reversed. I start to see like the boundaries between tablets and mobile phones blurring, right? So people want a bigger screen. There is a reason for that. Now, you might experience yourself that you do better work at the office with your desktop than you do on, definitely on your mobile. You can do anything apart from some silly reply emails. And uh, tablet, you can do something. Laptop, you can do better. Desktop is good. Because you need, um, you know, I think the amount of work you do is proportional to the uh, surface you can see, right? It's like a blackboard, right? You cannot do much work in a small blackboard. You can do a lot of derivations and nice discussions on a large one, right? So the same thing applies for, for a screen. So there has been this uh, kind of, you know, slider almost, right? Uh, so I don't think the size is really what defines the evolution in a sense. It's more sinusoidal. Rate has been definitely defining, right? The increase in, um, in generation number. So uh, there has been a, a constant ever-growing rate. So I do remember again using the modems in the beginning it's crazy how much faster you can go now with broadband, you know, and mobile phones in the beginning, they were really even very ugly, right, and very basic in what they could do. Quality was very bad. Now you can really take pictures, for example, with your mobile phone that are as good or better than with a normal camera, right? So these things have been, I think, defined in a generation. Um, there are some things that I think are a bit specific to 5G that I, again, I. 
I don't like to make it a big hype. So people always say the new generation is the ultimate one, best ever, nothing will be done. It's not true, of course. Things will keep happening. We have been going from riding a horse to going to the moon within 50 years. So the, the pace of um, technological and scientific achievements are, is exponential. So more and more it will be fast, actually. So I don't see why in, in an already acknowledged, uh, an acknowledged fastly evolving field, this should be an exception. It will be even more so, right? So if you do have like, uh, you know, other fields that show an exponential um, increase in the, in the achievements, I think our field will be even more exponential. So I do believe things will keep happening and it's almost unthinkable what we will have in ten, 10 to 20 years. I think it's very difficult to make predictions in our field beyond three to four years. Very dangerous, okay? Um, it is a dangerous thing to make predictions in science anyway. I, I was reading once a nice um, account of these wrong predictions by very notable scientists. So there was a scientist in the beginning of the electricity era. Uh, he said um, that there was the first electricity fair in US, I think. And then a very famous scientist said, um, you know, after this fair, we'll hear nothing about electricity. And then there was a picture in contents, what really happened, so they showed a modern city with all the lights, you know, so of course it's not the case, right? And another famous uh, wrong uh, forecast was about nuclear power. So there was a person, again a notable, you know, person, very acknowledged and very renowned, he said, uh, not, no, uh, this nuclear power business is going nowhere, something like this. And then again, picture of the atomic uh, bomb, you know, uh, explosion in, in Japan. Nothing good, but I'm, s you know, it's, it's a bit uh, like premature to just acknowledge this sometimes based on your current understanding. So I would be cautious about that. Some things you can, though, uh, foresee for the next few years. Um, it's a different set of devices, ever more integrating. So, for example, I do expect much more of the domotics applications, you know, personal health uh, measurements. Uh, there is so much research going on with machine type communication, what they call Internet of Things, machine to machine, that this will happen. Okay, so you will have in 10 years time, your kids probably will be very, uh, will be native in this sense with this new sort of device. I don't even know if this will be all in one mobile phone, or it's more a network, personal area network of devices, maybe both. But you will definitely have much more than what you do now with your mobile phone. It's not just about watching videos, sending emails, and uh, you know, taking pictures. It's going to be, in a sense, with few devices, you will control a plant, you will control uh, a house, you will control a hospital. This is going to happen, okay, I think. Now, I don't know if it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, but it will happen. Um, requirements are all different. So it's not just about data rate anymore. You want things to be very responsive in time, right? You want things to be very reliable. You want things to work in a congested situation. Now, what good is it to me if I have a peak data rate of X gig gigabit per second, if as soon as other few people join me in the same space, it, it collapses? There's no, nothing good at that. Uh, you might have experienced this problem in hotspots, in airports. No way it works if you are a few. And that's where you need it most. So what's good is it that I have a, an excess of broadband at home where I'm not competing with anybody and then when I do need it most, when I'm you know, in, a, in a competitive space in terms of resource um, need, I get nothing. So that doesn't work. Right? So there is a lot of um, emphasis on these things. So all of these things together, like the capability to compute more in mobile phones, uh, the natural evolution of networks, right? Technology has been evolving with Wi-Fi, LTE, you know, LT advanced and uh, whatever comes next. And these machines, they all kind of clash into a single, in a sense, big bang of, of, of traffic demand. Again, this um, traffic demand expansion is a bit of a buzzword. You always read, when you read wireless research papers, yeah, there is this dramatic increase, uh, doomsday scenario. No way that's the case, right? You, we, are, we are engineers, we know what we are doing, tough, for tough that the situation is, we will find out a solution. But it is true that you start to be in a, in a difficult uh, and constrained space where you, it's harder to find solutions because you don't want, people don't want to pay more, companies don't want to invest more, right? So they want to keep 
a certain uh, profit, so they don't want to get costs going too high up. And there are so many things you have to optimize that it starts to be a bit complicated. At least it starts to be a bit complicated with the traditional centralized idea of design. That there is a genie, it can be a telecom engineer, an operator, whatever, that design a network, it rolls it out, and then it works. I think it's increasingly more difficult for some of the scenarios we envision for 5G to do that. So that, that goes back to the um, final part of the course. So we are studying like uh, distributed techniques and you know um, suboptimal uh, allocation uh, with complex systems. So there are a few ways to game theory is another way to do that. So um, there is there is definitely uh, a change, okay, in the way. Um, uh, in, in the requirements from, from the networks and how we should tackle them. So there are uh, more, there is more traffic, okay? Again, this I think this um, forecast is from 2013, so things might have changed a bit, but in the main, people expect uh, thousands of increase in the traffic volume in the next few years, okay? So that comes from the fact that your smartphones will be uh, smarter and smarter, right? You will be able to possibly do video streaming all the time, uh, you know, and uh, uploading things to social networks. It's also difficult to come up. I'm not uh, an application guy, so I, I kind of have an idea, but you know, from forecasts coming from the, the people that study the traffic trends and the user, you know, behavior trends, it's clear that the things are going, um, yeah, are going up in a, in a steeper fashion than nowadays. Um, and new new services like you know uh, all of these um, new applications like e-health, uh, traffic safety, um, entertainment, um, uh, automation in factories, everything in a sense you deal with in your daily life will probably will be wireless at some point. Okay, so again, you see, I don't, I, there is a trade-off when you are uh, at least a scientist, a scientist that is worth his salt to be you know, a, a bit dreaming about things and also have to be down to earth. So I don't believe in the big hype, but I also uh, warn you to be too limited, okay? So if you just think back a few years and you see what you have now, again, you have to remember that the technological increase, uh, you know, the technological advancement pace is exponential, right? So don't think to tomorrow with the eyes of today. That doesn't work. You have to be to have a bit of a uh, imagination, right? Especially if you do research, it's very important. So there are many more devices that will be connected. So any single, uh, any single thing that will need to communicate will be connected. Okay. So you will have uh, reminders telling you to take a pill, maybe if you need. You will have, you know, uh, your car communicating with, I don't know, different oil stations, maybe telling you where the cheapest price is or what the closest, you know, oil station, especially if you don't know the place. Or uh, you will have, of course, a lot of um, communication between devices to avoid traffic accidents, you know, much more than nowadays. Uh, your, your appliances will communicate with the gateway to tell um, basically the, um, the consumption. It might suggest to you when it is better, for example, to do your laundry, just because the price of the electricity at that time is lower, or the consumption is lower, so you want to minimize the load of the network, okay? And many others, so I will not um, go through it uh, in detail, but there are many new things in terms of um, communicating devices, okay, happening. Uh, and that, of course, leads to different requirements, right? So you do have um, situations like device-to-device communications that are still not largely not present there, car-to-car -car communication, um, and things like uh, um, augmented reality. These are, you, they're more or less in the labs. At some point, they are supposed to, you know, reach the, 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 the user market. So you will definitely have a growth in what you need to provide, hmm? in, in any sense, can be just rate, can be delay, can be reliability, can be power efficiency, big thing power efficiency. Even now smartphones are very sloppy at that, right? If you have a smartphone, you know what I'm talking about. In that sense, the older phones with not so fancy capabilities, they're better off. They last in terms of battery much longer. These guys, after one day, they're dead. 
and you're not doing that much. If you're really traveling and working a lot with your emails and so on, even worse, okay? So there is work to do there. On the other end of the spectrum in terms of technology, there are some devices that are supposed to last forever, more or less, okay? So de you deploy sensors to um, uh, basically acquire data in some uh, situations, in some scenarios, and you want them to last forever in terms of battery. For example, you are, you are sensing the structural property uh, properties of a bridge. So you deploy your sensors, and it's very unlikely that you want people up there every day to change the battery, right, or every week. So you want, ideally, once the deployment is done, you don't touch it, okay? And you will also make it massive in a sense it's redundant. So you don't, if, if say, some nodes fail, and they will, you will not have to redeploy the thing, right? It's not like base stations. If a tower goes down, you have to do something. But these guys are more or less zero cost, uh, in, in a sense, infinite duration, and zero, you know, uh, zero technical problems, if you, if you will, OK? Um, now, from both the um, customer side and the um, uh, technology developer side, you want the solutions to be affordable and sustainable. What does it mean? Affordable means money. You want things to be cheap. Nobody wants to squander money. If I'm a user, I want to pay as little as I can to get some level of quality in my head. If I'm a developer, a company, whatever, again, same story, right? Because this is not going to be in your profit box. It's going to be in your your red right figures um, box of your budget and sustainable right there are few concerns here sustainable can simply mean you don't want to you know uh, recharge your phone every day it also means uh, I mean the power you consume in a network is not just your device it's much more right every base station will consume quite a lot of power okay so you will have um, environmental implications you have to feed these uh, base stations with some source of energy. Can be coal, can be oil. Nothing good about consuming too much of that, right? It costs, it pollutes, so you want that to be sustainable. Uh, and you do want, again, a, as the customers want their phone not to discharge too quickly, the telecom industry doesn't want to pay too high energy bills, right? They have a network with millions of nodes and they want to keep the energy consumption as low as possible. OK, so just to you know, uh, maybe add a bit more to this picture about the objective. So you do have higher uh, volumes of data. You do have more connected devices uh, expected. In the order, by 2020, I think Ericsson uh, predicted 50 billion. And I would say in the next few years, probably it goes up one order of magnitude, so 500 billion. Now, people on the planet will probably be, right now, 7 billion. It's going to be there about in the next few years. So you're talking in, in the order of 100 devices per person. Okay? So it's not just your mobile phone. So you know, get away from that idea. It's anything, potentially, that has to do with your daily life. Okay? Your car, your kitchen, your you know, uh, personal health, you know, your entertainment experience, whatever that is. You know, many different things will transmit. It's kind of your personal information space, right? There is a bit of that already, because I think if I ask now who has more than one wireless connected device, there will be possibly everybody, right? At least the mobile phone and the wireless and the, and the laptop will be in that category, in, right? And then you have tablets, and then you have, you know, um, probably you, with Bluetooth, you basically have all sort of uh, transfer of data, right, cameras, and so on. So it's already getting there. You do want very low data rates, not just for the sake of personal communication, but again, for what we call critical mission applications. What does it mean? It means, uh, for example, you are part of a rescue team that is um, you know, helping people um, in the situation of a bad road accident. Every second, uh, as I'm not a you know, medic, but I suppose you know that every single second that passes from a certain uh, you know, injury, it's vital, right? Especially, for example, in things like stroke right, or heart attacks. There, is, there are statistics, statistics that tell you the sooner the better. And it's really, again, exponential. You know, the more you wait, the, the more actual situation gets unrecoverable, right? So you want to act faster, let alone uh, uh, applications like um, telesurgery. No delay, right? You cannot, okay, you are operating somebody, 
uh, to the heart, okay, let's take a coffee. No, it doesn't work like that. Right? You, have to, you have to be fast, right? Um, there are some really uh, constraints in terms of um, human life uh, functioning that you have to respect, right? And not just, you know, so critical things. It can simply be uh, like uh, you are paying things uh, online, right? You don't want your uh, credit card details to be lingering in the hyperspace. Bad idea, right, with all the frauds there are and so on. Or personal information of any sort. You don't want that, your privacy to be um, hacked. Um, it can be as simple as, you know, having your medical record, right, online. So you want things to be communicated very fast. Um, and, and others, okay. So, um, yeah, battery I already talked about. I think it has become a big, much bigger concern than it used to be. So when I started my uh, research in 2003, nobody talked about energy. Nobody. It was just another resource you would try to optimize to get high data rate. That's it. Now it's kind of reversed. You might, for some application, you might give up on data rate, but focus a lot on power. Okay, that wasn't there a few years ago. Any questions so far? If you have any comment or question or curiosity or something you would like me to comment on, you yes, yes. I think so, and uh, I'm not an expert in security, and neither is anyone in my group. So that's something we kind of rely on with some other researchers, you know, to some other researchers. So we um, we do talk with other people when we have security questions. We don't do research ourselves, but I think it's a big issue. And anything to do with uh, personal data, you know, of any kind, it is going to be uh, possibly, you know, prone to security threats, right? Um, and imagine now, just, you know, to, to throw something on the table, if you have, um, you know, um, all sort of criminal intentions could be, you know, exploiting this increased connectivity, right? Say, for example, you want to attack a neighborhood. It could be very easy just to, you know, um, endanger the population of that neighborhood by starting to control the, their houses. Very simple things, right? You don't need to do switch off the lights, right? And then you, you do something bad, right? So, so y you do have a lot of issues. I think people are working on that, you know, and definitely uh, at least governments are very cautious about this, right? And there are associations of customers that are very active on monitoring the situation. So I, I cannot comment too much on the technical details, but I do know it is a concern and uh, it is something people are working on. Mm -hmm. So definitely one thing though we have to understand when you, you see, uh, there is a trade-off between being connected and being private. The best way to be private is not to talk to anybody, right? So uh, that's uh, by definition the most secure system. You, you dump your mobile phone and you know, whatever, but you cannot, you cannot do that, right? So there has to be, I think, a, a line uh, drawn, you know, that provides that you do progress with technology and business and education, whatever, you know, application, but you do make sure that people are secure, right? Not just as, uh, you know, physically secure, but also in terms of, you know, personal info. You can destroy the reputation of a person easily, right? If you get hold of, uh, say, of medical records. Say, you, I'm just throwing now a very silly example, but say you have an enemy in your profession and you get hold of some right, data, and they tell you that person is not in exactly good health. How easy would it be to, you know, sp insinuate some gossip? Ah, the person, you know, is going to be not really active, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so, of course, you want to avoid that, right? And my experience with human beings, you better, you, you better add two safety margins, you know. If people can do something bad, they will do even more bad, right? So you have to be aware of that, and especially now with, you know, terrorism and many other issues that unfortunately we are aware of. I, it is a concern and I think regulators, uh, industry, association of customers, they are all very aware of that. Any other comment, question? Yeah, feel free, okay, to interrupt me anytime. Okay, so just to give you a visual uh, idea what, what will, can you hear me well until the last row? Yes? Okay, so just to give a couple of examples of uh, performance um, requirements for 5G. So if you look like, for example, in this um, um, 
top left picture, okay? So there is on the y-axis, you have the data rate. So this is the peak data rate. What does it mean? It's basically the highest possible data rate you can provide between uh, a point of access to the network, say an access point or a base station, and the user. It can be a laptop, tablet, mobile phone. So you cannot go higher than that. What does it mean? That if you have, say, a peak of one gigabit per second, like in 4G, and you have three users, the most on average you can provide is uh, 333 megabit per second, right? So this is not per user, this is per point of attachment, okay? Right? Um, and you do see, even from this nice picture, I think this is a presentation from Samsung, so that basically the, uh, even visually, right, you see that this is an exponential curve, right? That's a mathematical function. So in 3G it, go, it went exponential, and then 4G, and then 5G, and all, together, this looks exponential, right? So things are confirming what we discussed before. And there is definitely a big discrepancy in the order of two orders of magnitude, more or less, between what you get in the beginning with the first commercial products and what is the end achievement of that technology. So even if you get 4G phones now, don't think that's the end of it, okay? 4G will keep, even if research sort of is stable, stabilized and not much more will happen in 4G in terms of research. In terms of development, things will keep progressing, okay? Because between the scientific papers and the product, there is a gap, right? About five to 10 years. So in our papers, we know that the peak data rate you cannot see with 4G is one gigabit per second, but probably the devices you have are at best one order of magnitude lower than that, right? So if you wait a bit, you will see that at least to a large extent, the promise of um, theory will be fulfilled, okay? So um, now the 5G, in a sense, I mean, because of this exponential increase, is going to be dramatically improving the situation, and we are talking about peak rates of 50 gigabit per second, okay? So now to give you an idea, 3G phone would perform what? Uh, one, two, Right, so one giga would be two orders, yeah? And then you add the giga, so another one, so three orders, right? So you have between, let's say, a, a good 3G phone and what will be a good 5G phone, you have three orders of magnitude difference in terms of data rate, a thousand times, it's a lot, right? Uh, what will you do with that? People will find applications, okay? You might watch all the cats videos you want on YouTube on your mobile phone. That's what you are after. Okay, I know that that's a big part of the traffic, unfortunately. But you do have, um, you do have, like you know, this will impact, for example, the way you can remotely control things. So it might actually start to really enable uh, remote uh, medication, like surgery. It might really enable uh, automated factory control. Okay, it might really enable safe. Uh, inter-car communication in congested areas. So I think this will help, okay? Th of course, there is a bit of silly applications like this. Uh, apparently, a lot of people watch cats videos on, on YouTube. It's a big thing, at least in, the, in Europe. Everybody's mad about cats singing and so on. So it's very silly, but that's, that's part of it, okay? You have to have fun also. So there is going to be, you can watch all your cricket games ev everywhere you are, maybe having even some augmented reality kind of feeling probably being surrounded by some sensors and really hear the sound of the bat, you know, and, and so on, and cheer of the crowd. So many things will happen, okay? So my main message here, be open-minded. That doesn't mean to be unscientific, okay? I'm not saying you have to bullshit, but you have to be open-minded. So don't judge what will happen in 10 years based on what happens today. If not, you do the same mistake of the electricity and uh, nuclear power prediction. You might uh, become a, a laughing stock, right? So you don't want to do that, okay? So you have to be open-minded. Um, latency, now, this is the latency between uh, the, um, uh, I mean, for a packet to reach uh, the core of the network, starting for, from your mobile phone. That's what we mean by end-to-end -end latency. And this is about 10 milliseconds in, in 4G, as far as I'm aware. So we want to push it down to one millisecond. I'm going back to that. There are some reasons why people are going that low. Now, one thing to consider, and I'm opening this uh, as a question to the audience, what are, wh are, are we bound by any physical limit here? Or can we go as fast as we want? I mean, can we go as short in this um, 
you know, in this, uh, f uh, let's say, x axis as we want. So can we go really much lower than this? What is the physical limit? Speed of light, right? So that's it, right? You cannot, unless we discover some sort of loopholes from physics, I don't know, okay, maybe at some point, but right now physics tells us that as fast, I mean, light is as fast as we can go, right? Because it's the same physics that regulate uh, visible light regulates radio, right? It's uh, Maxwell theory, basically, electromagnetism. So we cannot go beyond that. So at some point, we'll have to become really smart if we want to get that down in later. So I'm going back to that. So eventually, you want the quality of experience. So like the, the in a sense, the happiness that the user feels when he's, it's, he, he's or he or she is using the, the network should be uniform. What does it mean? Again, I'm not happy if inside my house alone I can get all the gigabit of this world and then immediately after I meet some other people nobody can do anything, right? So you don't want that. So you do want uh, to have a kind of uniform experience. It's fine. It might drop a bit if you're not that close to the access point or if you are in a dense scenario with many devices, but you still want some acceptable. So you don't want the quality to drop too much. Okay, so there is, I think there are people studying, not me, but there are some people studying the, in a sense, the user satisfaction patterns, right? So there are some psychological indications, like how happy you are, right? It's like when they ask you to grade a certain Skype call, right? So they do some, so it's not that they just do it for the fun of it, they use those data to improve the system, right? So, and it's not very, in a sense, um, quantitative, but it gives a good indication. So if you're very happy about something, nothing to change. If you're very unhappy about something, a lot to change. So these things um, help. I think more technically also, there is a big part of the research going on now with um, Bayesian networks, machine learning, these kind of things. So you do want to learn the behaviors of the users. Companies like Ericsson have huge programs and huge money invested in this. So they really collected a huge amount of data they crunch it somehow and they come up with very reliable understanding about what the users are experiencing now and what potentially they might need in the next few uh, months, right? Um, there's a lot to do with data analytics, big data. I'm not working on that. But if you want uh, a hot topic to, to do some research on, that's probably a good one. Okay, there is definitely a lot of work that is picking up right now. Deep learning, this kind of things are... There are a few people in my group that um, are doing work, if you're interested in knowing more about that. Not, not in my team, but in my research center. Okay. So scenarios, I said a bit about it. So you do have uh, you know, things like uh, virtual reality, uh, of course, uh, events like concerts or you know, religious festivals, uh, sport uh, events, right, where a lot of people gather. So that's where you stress the network the most because you do have to provide um, good performance with the same set of resources to a much broader set of users. So, you know, it's like, you know, again, to make a silly example, if you are, uh, if you are running the, the family or a business and you have to provide for twice the people, you will see that, you know, unless you get twice the wage, you might start to run into troubles and the same thing goes here, right? Um, emergency communications, like with hazard situations of any kind, um, traffic, um, yeah, like uh, factories, uh, you know, uh, any sort of appliance, right? Uh, like, for example, this, I think, is meant to monitor, like, the um, containers on a cargo, right? I mean, you, you name it, okay? So instead of you know, check in manually things, you would like the network to tell you how the things are going. So if you have a supermarket, how many products of some kind do you need, right? So you don't want to go there to the person checking, blah, blah, blah. So it, you want, I mean, my take, some people are a bit, uh, you know, uh, especially from outside the field of technology, afraid that eventually this will take away jobs from people. I have another approach. I think it will take away dull jobs. But you know, you will you will free people to do something more entertaining, more engaging, right? You don't want to have a person taking a form, right, counting things. You want a machine to do that. And then the person will do intellectually satisfying jobs or you know, having simply having fun. I don't know. But the the point is you want to aut automatize things to the extent possible. For another reason, another reason is also more reliable. 
Humans make mistakes. Machines make very few mistakes in comparison, right? So it will lead to profit. It will. You know, I'm not an economist, but I think there is a lot of rationale behind getting a better society, a better economy. Okay. So there are. If you're interested in this kind of bigger picture about the new markets tackled by 5G, there are there, there is a series of documents released by the European Commission. So the European Commission uh, is like the government of European Union, and they are the ones running the research programs. So they are the ones releasing funds for collaborative projects within Europe. For example, you know, I'm part of a project where Ireland and Greece and France and Germany and other countries are involved. You pull together resources based on the money you get from the commission, and then you do some research. Okay, so they, they, these guys, every five to seven years, they start what they call a frame program. So right now, I think we are in the third year of the current one, from 2014 to 2020. It's called Horizon 2020. And they do release documents on a regular basis with the trends, what they expect. Okay, So they would have a document describing the future factories, how wireless would help right, to increase the productivity, for example. They would have a document on, um, uh, you know, like uh, uh, smart cities. They would have a document on um, automotive, how the, um, you know, the wireless of the future would enable safer transportation, more efficient transportation, more integrated transportation, all of these things. Okay, so I don't think this will help you to write a paper, but this will help you to set the scene for your paper. So. Uh, one, you know, since many of you are research students here, one mistake normally people do is to focus too much in the beginning on very tiny details. I think you have to know why you are doing things. Then the how will come, right? I'm sure if I ask you now, I mean, that I was the same, by the way. If I ask you now how you are doing your research, you will come here and dump me, right? Uh, swamp me with equations and details and fine, that's great, but if I ask you why you're doing something, why exactly is it useful? Why people should bother reading your paper and taking it and implementing it? Very few would have a clue. O hopefully your professor, maybe not, <laughs> okay, but I think it's very important, you know, to start to have a clear picture and start to position yourself. Is it like because you want things to go faster and why? Like, what is good about moving faster with your mobile phone? Um, is it because you want to save energy and why? Why is it? Is it good if you have a wire system to save energy? Maybe not so much, but you know, for a mobile phone, yes. Yeah. So you have to try to at least position roughly your research within, you know, a potential application. That will also help you in selling your work later on. Okay, so I don't think I have to say too much about this. This is also like about uh, some, you know, uh, specific requirements. So there is latency, reliability. People are talking about. Um, Ultra reliable communication, I think, where basically things should never make a mistake if possible, right? When does it help? Uh, telesurgery, best example. Don't want any mistake there, right? Uh, if it's about exchanging some, uh, you know, picture, some mistakes won't hurt too much, right? So, but there are some applications where you'd really want to make it quick and good, right? Uh, rescue operation uh, during a fire. No mistake allowed. There is no misdetection you can allow. Misdetection means a casualty, right? So these kind of things have to be, uh, what they say, ultra reliable. Um, yeah, and then other things I already mentioned. So I'm just going quickly in the last part of this lecture through a set of possible um, applications. So this is what, the, at least in, the, in Europe, we call verticals. So vertical simply means uh, specific applications, okay? For example, transportation. So what they call horizontals is what I'm going to talk about in the next lecture. And these are technologies. Technology, by definition, is agnostic to any specific uh, application, right? So it simply means, I don't know, uh, that MIMO scheme, that modulation scheme, that uh, routing scheme. But these are things that are, in a sense, agnostic of the specific market, right? Vertical is different. So vertical, you go deep into a set of requirements that have to do with a very specific application or set of applications, okay? And they are all different. So what I'm going to use here is what we call a spider diagram, spider net, I think it's called, uh, spider diagram probably. It's like a, a comweb, right? So you do have basically 
some, uh, uh, like the vertices, are different requirements. And then how close you are to the vertice, to the final vertex, the external one I'm in, it means the more this requirement is uh, stringent. Right? So for transportation, for example, say vehicular to vehicular safety, you want latency to be very limited. Why? Anybody? Why do you want this, uh, this to be exactly on the external vertex? So very stringent latency requirements. If you have a vehicle. Right, but uh, why so much? I mean, what, what does it help with? So, you, I mean, you see, there is something to do with human reaction, right? So when you break, you know, there's not so much you can allow for, right? So you do have to have, in a sense, the, you know, the control system to be very, very reactive, right? Uh, so for example, if you forget to break, the car should do it. And should not do it a bit later, should do it now, right? Before, if possible, right? So, um, so these kind of things. And then there are other uh, <coughs> requirements, uh, other scenarios like uh, ITS means intelligent transportation system. This could be, for example, how you integrate uh, parking lots with, uh, you know, the uh, viability in a city, like uh, with the circulation of cars how you integrate the train and the bus and the tram and the cars schedule and maybe even with the airport arrivals, whatever, uh, right? So that's, that's what we call ITS. V2I is vehicular to infrastructure. It could, for example, means that you are downloading information when you pass by an access point. For example, you are on the highway, and now and then you do have, um, uh, right, like transponders, for example, relays that convey you information. So um, now, some th you don't have to think of the requirements to be all the same. So, s uh, when you think of communication, maybe you think about something always interactive, always real time. But many, many times you just want to watch things, to read things. So, it's not really real time, it's what we call delay tolerant networks, right? So, you can download it now, maybe in Karakpur, and then in the way to, uh, on your way to Calcutta, you, you process the information, right? So, you don't need this every time. You need it now and then, right? Or you want, for example, you are checking your paper, your newspaper. You will t it will take some time before you read the page, right? So you don't want instantaneous uh, download. You want it, you know, with some pace. So, um, so that's why it's a bit lower, for example, than this guy and then other things. Okay. So um, industrial automation and utilities. It means smart grids. It means uh, whatever electricity, water consumption, anything to do with. Uh, you know, um, your home or business or factory. So this is interesting because they are a bit different. So the basically, the um, well, in a sense, the utility um, smart grids is kind of a subset of the requirements of uh, industrial automation according to this document. By the way, this, this uh, association, GSA, it's basically the um, uh, operator um, mobile Operator World Association. So you might have heard of things like uh, 3GPP. So 3GPP is the association of manufacturers. So this would be the um, companies like Ericsson, Qualcomm, uh, Intel, uh, Nokia that are producing the, um, either the user equipment or the network equipment, right? Base stations or uh, Cisco maybe switches, you know, whatever. And then you do have um, the operators which are actually buying the equipment from these guys and running the network, like Airtel, Vodafone, and so on. So the second category uh, is, the, is um, basically gathering in GSA, which is the um, equivalent of 3GPP for operators. So they, again, release documents. And again, it's a good idea to get the general picture of where the networks are going to read these, what they call white papers. They're kind of manifestos about you know, their views and so on. So uh, they are providing some information about the forecast, about the traffic requirements. So um, you do have industrial automation, which is a superset of uh, smart grids at home because the requirements are higher, right? You do, I mean, companies want to make profit. So every single possible improvement is good, right? So they, of course, they have more money to spend, they have different budgets, different requirements. So they want things to be perfect in a sense. You know, as a, as a consumer at home, Okay, as long as you don't pay crazy bills, you're kind of happy. But those guys, they really want to take it to the extreme. So that's why you will see that this diagram is actually um, a superset. 
So for example, they want very low power consumption. Uh, you will have a lot of things connected. Mm -hmm. You want latency to be very low. Okay, and some other things, for example, won't matter too much. So again, to tell you that the game is changing, who cares about throughput here? It's not really the concern, right? It's not that the robots will have to exchange, again, videos of cats singing. I mean, they will have to exchange information uh, about, you know, the production. So check, it works. Or, or, you know, give me more of this. And it's normally not the throughput, the main issue there. Hmm? And same goes with smart grids. So your appliances will communicate, say, to the gateway or laundry machine to whatever, you know, uh, to whatever consumer. It will tell you, like, done, OK, the, the laundry is done. Or use it at 7 PM because it's going to, you're going to pay less. But you see, these are a few bits, OK? No matter how you encode it, it can even do very bad repetition coding. It's not going to take a lot of bandwidth, OK? So it's not all about high bandwidth. Uh, so, uh, last few examples on the health side. So there are a few things here. So there is like long-term conditioning mot uh, monitoring, condition monitoring, remote surgery, and remote diagnostics. Right. So this is like checking how you're doing, like a heartbeat or blood pressure or sugar level, whatever. Okay. This is like yeah the actual operation, and that's more in the long term. Now I'm not a medic. I suppose by that they mean. Uh, probably post-operation, um, right, um, thing. So it could even be just, you know, you keep an eye on the bones, uh, you know, density for elderly. Uh, I'm not, again, a doctor, but, you know, I think they mean something that has a longer time span, right? So the things are, again, different. And you would have, for example, that remote surgery, of course, latency. I mean, even if I didn't show this, you, you would guess that, right? It's a big thing. Um, long-term monitoring, since it's long-term, the power is an issue, right? Because you might have to monitor a person 10 years, and you don't want to, you know, the person to, you know, change the battery every every month. So that should last ideally forever. Mm -hmm. And then you have things like uh, diagnostics, which are a bit of both. Okay, at least, um, yeah. Basically, diagnostics might and um, and remote surgery they go back to some throughput requirements. Okay, because you do have, for example, um, to diagnose something or to uh, operate something, you do need remotely, you do need a very vivid picture, right? As good as it gets, high HD, right? You cannot have blurs and the, the surgeon you know, is kind of making a guess, right? It has to be as if the person was there. So you see that depending on actually um, on the actual application, you will have a different sets of requirements. Now, you might think this is all blah, 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 and I agree it is, but you know, the, the, the implication for a telecom engineer is important because depending on what you pick among these applications, you will have a very different set of requirements. Requirements are the beginning of your job. So if you are designing um, a technology and your target is health, you cannot go after transportation, right? You cannot over-focus, for example, on um, very connected or very high bandwidth, uh, you know, uh, consumption. You have to focus on maybe latency, maybe power. So you, for example, if you write your optimization problem, or you write your code, or you run your experiment in the lab, you will have to show these things happen. So I don't care if I am a doctor coming to buy or you know to gauge your solution. If you show me that this will work in an airport uh, hotspot you're never going to have the situation for a medical application. There's going to be one surgeon in the room, right, operating the patient. So that's not the concern. The concern is to be reliable. The concern is to be fast. The concern, if you, if you monitor something, is to be power efficient. So it's very important that you are aware of where you are. So I go back to my suggestion to read. It doesn't need to be European things, OK? You can read Asian or U US, whatever you want. doesn't matter. But this vertical business, these uh, new markets, this machine type communication, it's the new big thing in, uh, in uh, wireless. So up to 4G, I personally wasn't really much aware of this sensor network business. It was a community doing their own work, ad hoc things, whatever, and we were doing our own fancy advanced LTE things. What people start to advocate is that the next network, whatever it is, LTA++ or 5G, how, 
whatever you want to call it, should serve both. Should, you should, with one network, be able to accommodate a very wide array of requirements, right? So yes, smartphones that can do a lot of fancy things, but also tiny devices that are not so fancy, but are very important you know, for economy or for health. And ideally, you should have an infrastructure that's kind of morphing, right? You should concentrate your resources and maybe activate antennas depending on what you have to do. Silly example. You have uh, an array of antennas. Okay, you do MIMO, okay, the multiple antenna transmission. If you have a smartphone, you have to focus on that array. Okay, so you might configure your array to do some sort of um, high throughput precoding. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you basically uh, have reliability as a constraint, you might be better off moving towards spatial diversity techniques. As an example, okay. Or, um, you know, uh, if complexity, so power consumption, in a sense, is your issue, you might want to pick a waveform which is, um, in a sense, uh, less complex, like OFDM. Hmm? But if you want to focus a lot on, uh, you know, um, out of band, so very dense requirements, and, uh, you know, um, you have, in a sense, um, let's say you have a um, less stringent budget on complexity, you might go for some of these new waveforms, like a filter bank, just to make two examples. So depending on the scenario, what you should do is to design your network. And ideally, you should not redesign the network every time a new service comes up. You should have the network adapting, right, to be service uh, aware. That's what we say, right? So the network should be service aware. Now, the traditional approach to this thing is what we call um, um, a network aware service. So the network does what it can, and then the service will somehow live with best effort, okay? Skype kind of thing. Now the situation is reversed. You see, it's not network aware services, it's service aware networks. The network should take the, the onus, right? They should lead to satisfactory quality of experience. It's very different, okay? So it's, and in my experience, that has changed. That wasn't like that a few years ago. Hmm? Okay, now virtual augmented reality, again, you focus on high throughput, low density. Now virtual reality means, for example, simulations, gaming, right? Augmented is more adding dimensions to your reality. For example, that would help, uh, say, hearing impaired people, right? Or this kind of thing. Or so maybe even, you know, perfectly um, able people, but you would have, you know, adding some dimensions like uh, Google glasses, right? This kind of thing. So. Definitely here we are focusing, it's in a sort, in a sense, similar to smartphones, right? Because the interaction with the user is very tight. So if you go towards the user, you focus more on throughput and latency, I would say, right? If you go towards machines, I think it's more reliability and power, but with a grain of salt, okay? Not mathematical definition. Uh, smart cities, again, you have uh, different um, requirements. If you do traffic management or emergency, say, uh, support uh, of, 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 of a sort. I think I gave you the message. Now, you know, the best way to go about this, you, you, I would suggest you read some documents, you get at least some understanding, and you try for your own sake to position what you do within one or few of these areas. That will help you after your PhD to take your career further, to be aware of why you did things. So this thing is good, not for the how, that will come later in the course. This is good for the why. Um, the last, last word I want to say on tactile internet. So that has been uh, emerged, uh, that has emerged uh, in recent years. It's basically to do with the sensory, um, the sensory machinery of, of human body, okay? So there are some response times that have to do with the sense you are using, okay? For example, if you interact, uh, it's kind of a combination of um, visual, maybe hearing, and uh, tactile uh, input. So when you interact with a computer, the interaction span is about a second, right? Between you start to complain, be before you start to complain, it has to be longer than this. So w when the, the keyboard gets stuck, it's clearly beyond one second. But as long as it's within one second, you're happy, more or less. When you hear things, um, the, you go down one order of magnitude. So you start to complain about your phone call or you know, listen to, uh, when you listen to some music, when the delay is beyond 
100 milliseconds, more or less. Uh, with uh, sight, you go down one order of magnitude, so it's 10 millisecond. And so you start to, you see, you, 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 it's easier for you to recognize glitches visually than you know, some, uh, something going wrong with the, with the sound, right? You do it, you do see it immediately, right? It's kind of natural. It's like a very quick sensory input. And now, I think the fastest of them all is tactile. So uh, again, there are some uh, you know, physiological studies. You can look into details. Um, I'm not a doctor, but e you know, the, the perception you have uh, in, in the tactile sense is one millisecond. So if you, have, if you start to have interactions you know, about um, uh, you know, that is tactile in nature, you will start to complain when things are slower than one millisecond. So if you start to have this kind of virtual reality where you touch things you know, and you expect really you know, to, to manipulate things with your hands, um, you will have a very stringent requirement. So there are applications. Uh, I'm not an expert in that, but I suppose gaming, right? It's, uh, it's important, or virtual reality. Um, and, you know, again, telesurgery. The surgeon is very tactile in nature, right? It has to get the scalpel, the knife, and it, it's all about hands, right? So d for these applications, you need to go way down in the delay compared to nowadays. So to give a final message, when you talk really, I mean, yeah, people talk about 10 milliseconds. Really, the delay you experience in LTE networks nowadays is about 50 milliseconds, OK? Between the time you, you send something and you, you receive uh, uh, an answer, OK? Still OK, because we saw the sound. Um, it's about under milliseconds, so you're good. But you see, if you start to go into visual or tactile, even worse, this won't work. Right? So there are situations where the current network will, will not work. Um, so you do have to, to do something about, for example, making smarter frames or transmission, um, uh, the time, t time transmission intervals. And people are working on fast, like Intel is working on faster uh, hardware, real-time radio resource management, um, real-time operating systems. People are talking about these network operating systems now with SDN, optimized routing. Uh, small frames has to do with what uh, it, there is a part, actually, even on information theory, looking into what they call short length codes. So the Shannon theory is all based on asymptotically long codes. But that doesn't suit right quick applications. Uh, keeping in mind that there is only so much we can do when we hit the barrier of speed of light. Right, so we are getting close to that. Still, some way to go. But if you consider the hardware impairments, you know, the time it takes to travel for the masses and so on, this is very challenging already. I'm going back to this later on. Okay, so it took a bit longer, but I think we are more or less okay with time. Any last question or comment? Okay, if not, we meet at three today. You have a question? No, no. We meet at three today, and we go more into the. So today was more about the vertical part of the story. Uh, this afternoon, we go more into the horizontal part. So you, we are going back to uh, technologies for 5G. Okay, And then tomorrow, we will start with the real business of the course, in a sense. OK? Thank you. Sorry? Attendance. Uh, yes. Uh, how should I do it? You'll do it. OK, so yeah, please sign, uh, sign the attendance sheet, right? Yeah, good. It's important for the exam, yeah.